Good day, wonderful people, and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. Today, I've got a very special episode for you, and I always say that every single time, and it's going to become a meme at some point once the uh, podcast episodes start popping off, um, but we're going with it. <laughs> Today, we are going to be talking about reasonable adjustments in the workplace, in education, what are they? How can you ask for them? Um, what you know style of reasonable adjustments should organizations or educational um, places be doing? And uh, what's the most common type of thing that they're doing? Today I'm joined by the very lovely Corinne. I got it right, didn't I? Okay, good. Yeah, nailed it. I'll do a dance for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yeah, how, how are you doing today, Corinne? I'm doing pretty good. I'm really busy, so I feel it. We were talking earlier about like, oh, you know, like so much stuff adds <laughs> up and you're like, I got to keep going, got to keep going, got to keep going, and you forget to do self-care. So yeah, mm. I feel you. <laughs> I'm def- definitely still in work mode because I finish at like 4.30 to 5 p.m. usually, and it's about... 20 to 6 so I'm, I'm still trying to like get my head in the space because and i squeezed you right between clients so like <laughs> yeah. i have my students then i have other clients i work with so you're like right in between all of them cool so yeah very good cool. I, I appreciate you <laughs> fitting me into your schedule um of course uh just a little update from me actually we have the autism show in manchester coming up soon and it's something that i'm going to be speaking at i think on the friday and karina you i I seem to remember seeing your name i don't think i'm in that one but i know someone told me that they thought i was too so one of my they were making jokes did they hire you and forget to tell you (laughs) so if that's the case let me know but yeah i i know i think carol jean and a couple others might be there so i have yet to carol's carol's going I think Carol is. There's like a couple she's doing. See, the problem is, is you guys are so popular and awesome sauce. You forget that like people like me, we're in the background. You know, I'm like the one making accommodations, reasonable adjustments, all these things. Doing, I don't usually doing go the... speaking as much. I make it so you guys can speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just in the background and I love it there. <laughs> Carol, Carol Jean's the social auty for, for anybody. Um, oh, yeah, mind your sorry. autistic brain um, for anybody who doesn't know. Very lovely, lovely lady who um, has been helping me out with a few things as well. Same. So, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I think the last time that we spoke, because I usually do like pre chats for like half an hour, and I think we spoke on the phone for about two hours. (laughs) Yes, we did. We spoke for a while. I mean, it was cool. I was like, you know, told people it's so weird when you're in autism advocacy, you actually meet people you link with, and it's a real link. It's a, Oh, I don't have to mask with you, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Or oh, I can be accommodating. You know, I can talk about my needs, wants, and desires in a more less stressful environment. Mm. Um, so, so I saw yeah. a lot about personality as well. Like, have you ever done the? Um, is it the Myers Briggs, the sixteen personalities test? I have not. I've heard you about it. Okay. Um, I had students who did it. I had clients who did it. But I have not. Because <laughs> just have. just like with the um, the sort of the the internal sense for autism, um, I find that I'm quite I'm quite good at finding people with my with my personality type because we tend to to get on a lot more. Um, it's usually the the INFJ personality type, the advocate, which is like probably doesn't mean anything anything me just saying it but you should you should look it up after <laughs> I definitely will. You should. Um, when i have some free time i'll look into it yes of course <laughs> of course when you're your busy 40 hour working <laughs> oh my god well yeah I for your podcast it. people what i do is i teach part-time online so i work one-on-one with students who are in hospitals or have disabilities who can't go to school right now and so i work with them to make sure they're able to catch up on work I also work with IEPs for parents and students alike to advocate in an IEP meeting, right? Like a lot of parents are like, what is IEP? What are all these like weird words? Actually, it's autistic adults too, by the way. I have a lot of autistic adults. <laughs> go, I didn't even know I had an IEP. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, what's a 504 plan? So I help a lot with like um, school place advocacy, um, whether or not that be doing a write up or just going into the actual meetings. It's actually how I started special education. <laughs> I was an English teacher 
the school refused to work with the aut kids. So I a case managed five autistic kids and then taught 180 kids English. So mm. um, that's what got me into special education. And mm. now I'm on top of that, you know, I'm a workaholic. I work with Carol Jean, Jessica, Michaels, Allie, and Jamie. I'm sorry, girls, I forgot your last names, but we do a thing called NeuroDrive where we're working with businesses. We go into businesses, we present, and each of us is a cog in the machine, and we're trying to empower both the employer and the employee um, to make a better, more inclusive world for workplace specifically. So, yeah, if you're interested, go on Social Audi, her website, you'll see NeuroDrive and reach out. Definitely. We'd love to talk. So definitely, definitely yeah, check it out. Very busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know. I, I always find it, it's, it's quite, it's quite crazy. Cause a lot of the, the social media stuff and the YouTube videos and things of that nature tend to be on, I don't know. It's, I kind of have to, in, in my mind, I have like the idea of what the autistic community is and you have like this a bubble of autistic adults who, you know, it tends to be that we talk a lot about particular traits of autism or particular ableism, you know, masking, things of that nature, you know, f- things that are really kind of interesting and more language and more sort of, so, sort of progressive kind of style things. And then you have the research side of it, which, you know, I'm not going to explain too much, but you've got the research side of things and then you have the education workplace, you know, things, things of that nature. And, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to chat to you is because um, I find it really interesting when those bubbles sort of cross over. Cause I, I've, I've always tried in my life to kind of dip, dip my hat, dip my feet into each of the bubbles. You know, I did some, some, um, special needs stuff. My mum's an SEN person, and I, I think as I think as well, you know, around research because of my biomedical sciences background, I've kind of. So I thought I thought it'd be really great to to have you in to talk about, you know, some things that perhaps a lot of um, autistic individuals who are part of those part of that bubble don't necessarily hear about. I don't know where exactly this sentence, this this paragraph of text is going, but... <laughs> well, and I'll tell you, it's so interesting you say that because um, recently I've been working with NeuroDrive on creating our own lists of accommodations mm. and we're all in different places. I told each of the girls, I'm like, you guys are fabulous. Like I get to practice with the spectrum of what it's like to ask for accommodations because some people have never even had someone ask them, what are your mm. needs? They're like, what? And it's a shock and they got to process through this. They're like, okay, I need a couple of weeks to really think this through. Other people are like, oh, I've had workplace accommodations. Wait, I never thought that was an accommodation. Wait, what? And mm. so like, I have the people who kind of know, and then you have others who are like, these are my needs. And then they're like, wait, I didn't think about this. So it's been really fun working with people who it's a spectrum, right? For mm. accommodations and modifications, let alone like, what are your needs? Um, mm. I'm very... My version of an accommodation, you know, is that we are meeting, getting our needs met, whether it be in our workplace, by our teaching staff, by our education. That is what an accommodation is, is it's a way to meet our needs. Mm -hmm. Um, When I did research um, for just NeuroDrive, I learned that HRs and businesses are set back and like the schools used to do this. It's called a deficit based model where you're focused on the things people can't do. And mm-hmm. so we're in this system where people are so used to saying all the things they can't do, right? I'm having these meetings with amazing advocates and I'll offer it to you. You know, I've been working on lists. If you ever want to do one, we can meet together on it. You know, you go, I'd love you're, to. <laughs> oh my God. It was inspired by, um, we went to an event, a couple of women of us in NeuroDrive and it was horrific. Our accommodations were not met. They were all over the place. And I was like, we need to me and my organized freak self, as you know, was like, we need to organize this. So that's what happened. So we could talk about that. But it's true. I think a lot of people think accommodations have to be just for education, just Mm. for work, but it's really a life thing. Um, And the reason I had to start looking at my own accommodations to share a personal story is when my needs are not met, my seizure disorder acts up. (laughs) So I don't, I've had to come up with my own accommodations quite a bit because it was like, if I don't get my needs met, very black and white, right? Uh, My body's like, 
bye, Felicia. Um, we're out for the day. <laughs> I'm not letting you do this. So Actually, I always tell people, I'm like, it's not fair for me to say, like, I just physically cannot cope. And it's this blessing and a curse simultaneously. Because it's like, if my needs aren't met, I am screwed. So yeah. it was really horrible because, and it's quick. Like, it was two weeks in a workplace, you know, I'd have yeah. an issue. And I'm like, what's going on? And I was like, oh, my doctor's like, well, did you get your accommodations? And I'm like, I've been fighting the whole entire time for them. So that's really why I became so passionate about accommodations, making sure, like, get rid of reasonable, right? So you have like, a literal always- sensor for, for not and getting I'm sorry, your accommodations. It's a shock factor story, <laughs> but it's true. And I realized that, like, there's some people who never had that because they just, they're so incredible. They were to cope through it. And I never mm. had the ability to do that. So I suppose I think- that there'll be some, there'll be some people out there who, who, who never ask for accommodations and never get accommodations, but like they put so much energy in, in order to make up that distance that make, make up the, the, the lost time and the energy and the stress and like. Well, and the way they told know. it to me is like, they feel it, but they didn't realize what it was. And so I used to be that way until my brain injury, I used to be able to cope through a lot of it. And then it's like, now I just can't, <laughs> you know, the new brain is like, no. No, we just don't have a choice today. So I think it's important, though, to note it's a spectrum, right? Whether or not we're talking about autism, disabilities, or accommodations, modifications, like it's a spectrum, you know, and so it's so individualized, it overwhelms people and they try Mm -hmm. to put us into a system, right? My favorite is workplace coach. Oh, here's a workplace coach. Okay. Well, like, that's very individualized. Like, I don't need a workplace coach. I can't tell you how many times. Jobs like, oh, we'll give you a workplace coach, coach, you know, to help you out. I'm like, I don't need that. I need a hybrid opportunity or like I need like a, you know, control of a setting. And so it's interesting how when people see autism, they have these assumptions and I'm like, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, ask the individual, right? And then I don't know, through these little meetings, I've learned that it's harder for some people to actually vocalize it. And so we use examples, right? Like, Oh my God. One of the stories I heard was horrible was like they were getting fired and like they felt like the manager was so excited to fire them. And I was like, well, how did that feel? So how do we stop this? And so we talked that out. So it's like a weird therapy about how to get your needs met (laughs) and a solution based. I think something I see a lot of times in the autistic community advocacy is here's all these problems, not a lot of solutions. No. So it's nice to be a part of a solution because that's who I am. If I'm going to complain, if I'm going to throw a little tiff, I got to have a something I think, to solve. I think with. we were talking about that the last time that we, we met. And I, you know, immediately my, my thoughts went to, oh, I'm a problem person. <laughs> like, but I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> I, yeah, taking a step back, you know, I, I'm, I'm vocalizing my problems for constructive means. <laughs> <laughs> well, for a solution, I was, even when we were talking, I remember I was telling you, I was like, look, you're thinking about like, what can we do? Like, I want to solve this. I call it out mm. loud processing, right? You're processing this and you're not saying I hate the person or I'm angry. You're like, I want a solution. Like, this is frustrating. And that's how I feel a lot of people feel with whether or not be work needs or education needs too. Like they're frustrated, their needs aren't being met. Mm. And they're like, Hmm, how do we do this? Some people do great vocalizing it. I am one of those. I love talking. I could talk all day. Other people do better with writing. You know, they want to mm. write that out, write out that process for them. And then it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that you say that because I started off as a as a writer mostly. Um, I I spent like I don't know, upwards of five or six years just writing constantly about new new sort of phenomena that I've noticed in my life and myself and in neurotypicals and in different situations and sort of contrasting that with various bits of literature. Um, and you but can it, it ended up that I actually just, yeah, well, I, exactly. Like I, I like doing the podcast. I like doing the public speaking and the videos. Um, but I also sometimes don't want to be on camera. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to be recorded. I want to be able to meticulously write down everything that I I mean in this and sometimes I get I get the words wrong and you know I do a lot of my writing on social media and that means that the word limit is very concise and the word limit is also um, a big barrier for 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 doing explanations for certain statements Um, 
I, fi- I find it re- that's the really really hard bit about writing these days is that you have to be very punchy you have to be like it's it's all about the opener and the statements and you've got to make statements at the start and the conclusion's got to be up there right in the view of everybody um because most people just like flicking through photos and <laughs> it's, well it's and such I think a, that that's sorry, part of the problem on. with accommodations and adjustments in the workplaces is that we want to insta fix and these mm. are not insta fixes right sure. like this is a you have to think about it it's a process it's a time thing and i found that a lot of people you know in hr they're like i just want to fix now i want to fix now i'm like well, that's not possible um, it's, it's just so- also crazy it's crazy to me that that there's not there's not a system for individualized support it's like well there might there may be a system for individualized i don't even support, want to call but- it a system it's a system that's designed to make it hard to be individually supported and mm. so if you go in you request your accommodations and then you're like all right here's my accommodations here's my doctor's notes it's a process that some companies take eight months to do some take years and then they don't even get the accommodations. And so that's where I have a problem where it's, it's so time consuming for everyone involved. It's not effective for businesses or for the employees. And so that's kind of where I've Carol laughed, but like I have a solution, you know, that I've talked to a lot of businesses about where it's like, we need to streamline this. We need a system that's more, pragmatic that actually works for everyone involved because the system we're in right now doesn't. And a lot of times if you read the laws and legislation, particularly in the United States, you know, I went to these government websites that HR is used and I was like, I mean, one of the accommodations is they're not, they keep asking, fire them, find a way to let them go. And so it's really, yo, yeah. And I have friends that are business owners who say the same thing. They're like, well, that's the law, but I'm going to not do the law because I want to do better. So it takes special people in a corrupt system. Um, and so I that's, think that's just the laws are more on the side of an employer <laughs> than an employee in this case. Even though we have the IDA Act, a lot of people are not, not only is it not being upheld, it's not being enforced. So like, you know, like I said, like I was, I love the line. People are like, oh, businesses can't be biased against you if they have a disability. Oh, yes, they can. They can't say I fired you because you're autistic, but they can say it wasn't a good fit. Yeah. It and so a lot of people they had don't... These, these traits and stuff that stop them from these autistic tra- these traits that are not, I'm not saying that are autistic. They're just this no, it's person. it's true, right? <laughs> like, it's like, oh, you're a weirdo. You're fired. And I've had companies do this where they're like, we don't think you could handle the stress of this place. And I'm like, I've been here for three weeks and been fine. So, you know, I, it's where it's frustrating. And I think right now workers, we're in this huge worker revolution that's starting Um, the great exodus of employees. You know, we have strikes, we have people unionizing and I want to ride that wave with disabilities and accommodations and race and really bring it all into here. Because right now the corruption of the workforce and business practices are coming. They're bubbling. COVID-19 brought it out, right? People lost their jobs. It was like a huge, like, I don't want to say S show, but S S show, you know, like mm-hmm. first words, you know, mm-hmm. United um, because it's true. And I think part of what happened is, is that people are like, I'm done. Okay. Like we almost died because of COVID, like all this stuff happened. Like we need to change how we work. Sure. And there's this very, I don't think it's just American, which makes me sad for this model of, if you are poor, it's your fault. If you are, you know, you are mm. lesser if you're not able just to blend in, if you're not able to fit in, there's something wrong with you instead of being like, Hmm, let's think of the bigger picture, like what's going on. And I think that is where most people lie. Like people need supports, you know, it's not like diverse people, nor diverse people. We just need extra supports. doesn't mean yeah. we can't do the job. Sometimes we do better actually. Or, or <laughs> you di- know? different so supports. I, yes. And so I think that's part of the problem is it's like, we're so focused on social construct, what is normal. And we all need money in this world. doesn't matter. Like if you're, you know, I don't I hate the terms, you know, mild, mild, I don't hate them. I yeah, yeah, I'm, mild, mild, like severe high, or high, high functioning, functioning and low functioning. I high hate functioning high functioning, needs. low functioning labels. <laughs> oh God. They use them all the time in workplace accommodations. And I hate it because the idea of functionality is so biased. Right. 
But part mm. of functioning and being able to function is getting your needs met, which is an accommodation. So mm. I've had a few HR people make faces at me. They're like, I was like, that's why I got a degree in English. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And then I'd never hear from the job again, but it was worth it. I, <laughs> it I picked so, up, I picked sorry. up one, one thing from, for, well, not obviously just one thing, but one thing really <laughs> sort of put my ears up, which was about um, the time needed for accommodations is very, very long. And yes. if you if you're saying that like it's eight months or above, like kind of eight months or above kind of thing, like most probations are, you know, in that time, right. then that that's when they tend to need the need the support. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, I had a school just, that just, said a year they would not accommodate me until I worked there for a year. Oh my god! Oh, I and that, that was for for your probation as well. Well, no, they were like, there's no probation. We just don't give accommodations till after a year. Hmm. And like, they had this whole timeline and that was the workplace took me two weeks and I was so sick and I had to quit. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I'm leaving and I will never work for a charter school again because of them. (laughs) (laughs) I've had plenty of issues with accommodations, but oh boy, did I learn charter schools. They're going to hate me. I can hear them like boiling, but like this one particular charter school made it me really have a bad taste because at least the district tried to accommodate me. They at least tried to work with me. Like there was conversations to be had. Yeah. But never at this one particular charter school. So. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> well, they're a um, profit model for a reason. I just, just uh, being very, just being wary of um, our time. Yeah. I think I got questions one and two down. <laughs> yeah. I think we, we, we've, we've probably gone through a couple of the questions but we'll 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 sort of brush upon it a little bit what got you into you know working in in into education and how did you make that move from education the the arena of education to the arena of the workplace i still kind of have my foot in both which is nice because there's a lot in common right um i'm mm-hmm. a part-time in education right now and i work part-time in the workforce But I will say it was my needs not being met. I had no choice. Like I'm sitting here trying to teach. I love my students. The principal and I are getting on great. But my needs are not being met and HR is a nightmare. And so I had to leave a job because of HR. I had to leave a job because my accommodations aren't being met. And so I became frustrated. That's really poor. So I just was like, you know what? Like, And that's when I started getting more and more into advocacy. Was was this this SEN education or was it just mainstream this was a um, charter school here in Stockton um, that is a phenomenal school. That's why I don't name them. The school itself, fantastic. The company that runs it, HR. Fantastic. <laughs> so I don't want to undermine the work these incredible educators are doing and sure. these people are doing. So that's why I never named the school, like the mm-hmm. particular charter. But I will say that in a public school setting, they were much better at re- doing me. And so, like, for example, the district here in Stockton um, basically sued me for paychecks they had given me that I didn't ask for and threatened my credential. So um, I've had issues with both. I will say it's a funny story. I think I got more scared of Stockton and I don't think they held the power that I thought they did looking back. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're having like 20 seizures a day, your mind is not in the right place. Either. Of course. Like so, that's, that's pretty, you know, pretty out there. A lot there of my friends are like, of- we get why you had to give, you know, your money back and everything because like, they were like, you know, you were in a rough spot and you're, there's a reason you're not teaching at the moment. Right. So how did I you make that, that move that the move from the education to the, to the workplace? Like. I what was so describe. I think it was just kind of like I said, like I just kind of was like, I'm tired of dealing with HRs. So I started talking to people, venting, and then it was kind of like, well, what's the solution? What's the solution? And then I still have always stayed in education, though. I've always worked with students, whether or not be part time, because I don't want to leave education. I feel like there is. I love teaching mm-hmm. and I want to keep that if I'm able to do it just with one kid, just to make their eyes sparkle. It's worth it. Uh, I have a lot more patience also for students than I do for adults, <laughs> Just <been> the other, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, I think that for me, it was just like, it's this weird shift of where you're like, you can imagine me if you're able to imagine me standing like between both is yeah. where I feel like I'm at because there's so much things that cross over accommodations mm-hmm. cross over in both. And, you know, the deficit based model is what schools used to be in. 
And I see how beautiful it is now that we're in a needs-based model. You know, we're in a student-centric model in SPED, and it's a huge shift right now happening. And so I want to create that same shift in the workplace. It's like, sort of a, a um, creating a channel between the bubbles to allow them yes, to, exactly. uh, to, to mix them. I'm in the up. gray area. I'm like a gray <laughs> bubble that's like, a bubble the both. <laughs> Grass, yeah, grasping love... onto chains, holding the bubbles, pulling them together. <laughs> yes. I'm going to do like a Thor moment. You know, yeah. Um, I haven't yeah, seen I... it yet, but I've seen, I've seen memes around it. I've, I've, I've seen, seen his trailer, absurd, so... I've seen his absurd physique that he has yes. for his. <laughs> I will become a Thor for a moment. And oh you're my like, God. <laughs> Don't think I could ever be that strong. I think physically. you think you'd have to hop on a steroid cycle to do that. <laughs> I, I think so, and I, I just I don't like the look. You know, no, I no. yeah, <laughs> sure. I'll be strong in other ways. But uh, yeah, I think that's kind of what happened. Is I just found like you talked about like all the connections, all the like mm. you know syncrasies. I think is what they call it. Where like two things just keep connecting and just keeps sure. happening. Um, that's definitely been my life. So that's definitely why I got into the workplace and. Reasonable adjustments, you know, a person can ask for in the workplace. I mean, that's a tough one, right? You can ask for anything, but you're never guaranteed to get it. And that's where it's frustrating mm-hmm. because it's like you should. I'm dealing with a client right now who, poor thing, like did all the right things. She wrote out very dis- beautiful descriptions of what she needed, very specific. And they took this phenomenal list she'd created, you know, broken down and made it into three bullet points. And, you know, I remember Carol Jean's like, what's going on? And I was like, oh, they took these beautiful accommodations and forced them into the reasonable accommodation model. And she's like, is that what happened? I'm like, uh-huh. So I'll be working with them. No, no, but yeah, no. it's just, that's one of many, like my own story. My doctor and well, I spent hours, hours about my own accommodations, right? Like we're going to tailor it to this job. We're going to do hybrid on Wednesday, for example. Corinne's going to go home early and she'll be be able to do staff meetings from home because it's a short day, you know, and it was straight up. No, (laughs) no. I'm like, I mean, this is doctor documented, signed, my neurologist, my primary, all of these doctors were on this and it was like, no. (laughs) (laughs) So it's what I tell people is like, keep fighting for your needs. You know, we're in a, crazy movement right now where there's a big exodus of people too you know right now workers do hold a power they didn't have in the past if we so. if we sort of you know take a take a little bit a time segment at the moment but with the um of what you what you're saying about the the deficit model and things things like that you know what sort of reasonable adjustments could people generally ask for in this in this current climate of the workplace work coaches are very popular more time like Mm -hmm. time to process which i found actually helps a lot of people just giving that time to process very much so about it's kind of when you say that because i go into my own deficits thinking of things i can't do and i haven't been able to get right so note that we all are human but i think one of the bigger ones would be like a workplace advocate asking for more times clear and concise language it's one of the number one things i say in an iep Use clear and concise mm-hmm. language. You know, if you want to have a meeting, who does the meeting go to? You know, like who is invited to said meeting? Having lists is something else a lot of workplaces have been doing. And that is actually Ali, Jessica, and all of them who have taught me that one where it's like they just are like, be specific, right? Who do they need to speak to for this problem? Who needs yeah. to happen? And, you know, because one of the bigger issues that's happened is like, you know, autistics were kind of black and white and so mm. we're this is your management this is your supervisor go to them for everything yeah and then we go to them for everything and get in trouble for it so yeah. it's kind of like give us a clear <laughs> list okay if you're having payment issues go here just email me issue, anytime you need help like emails and then they get angry once when every you do. hour like <laughs> yes. yeah i mean my own boss is funny because she was like she just i was like can i get a list of like what i need done and she was like okay <laughs> still hasn't done it <laughs> But it was one of those, you know, she started texting me like, okay, this person, this person has issues come up. But, you know, I was like, a list would have been helpful. So I still haven't gotten my own list. But it's something I think that's a reasonable thing to ask people. Hey, give me exactly who I need to talk to for what situations. And it's a very, it depends on the business too. 
like there are some businesses that are very open to this, whether or not it be in education, like all the different sectors, right? Like that are open to this feedback of like, yeah. help me. Others are not. And so I always tell people, you feel like your boss your, is not listening. You might need to go. And I know it's cruel as someone who, you know, has had to leave of quite a the few ideal, jobs now. The ideal would be all the, you know, the accommodations are made and they stay there, but it's you not know, up to them. So, and exactly. And so I found that like, even in certain businesses where people wanted to accommodate me, the HRs wouldn't allow them to, hence the charter school, you know? Mm. So I think that it's important to kind of know your limits too, right? Like, so if you ask for your reasonable accommodations, you ask, you're trying to be proactive. You're not saying, screw you. You didn't do your job. I'm miserable, right? Like so there's people who do this and they're like, I got fired. I'm like, mm-hmm, I bet you did. So you have to be, I would say like, Peace, you know, PC. Like it, but it's kind of like Peace. a mask you put on. You're like, hi, um, I need help. Let's help each other. I and really I always, hate you and your organization. Oh, not yeah, really. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I've done that. I've had big smiles. And I'm like, hi, so we need to talk about what's going on. Let's chit chat. And one of yeah. my friends, she was like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's, that's the current signal. Because it's my scripted, very, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like always my, one of my girlfriends calls it. Um, Corinne is going to kill you with kindness, literally. <laughs> and it works. It works a lot. You'd be surprised. I've won a lot of people over, even if I didn't like them, even if I was boiling mad. But as a teacher, you can't show a student you don't like them. And that's yeah. what really helped me out. So I feel the same way about workplaces. I'm like, mm-hmm. I can't show you. I hate you. <laughs> yeah. So it's not fake. It's real. And I think that's something else. A lot of people are like, oh, that's so fake, Corinne. You're masking. No, I, I think in the world we have to mask for certain things. And being in business, being professional is definitely mm-hmm. one of them. I, it's, it's a really hot topic. Well, hot topic for me at the moment um, around masking because... You know, I've I've got a very sort of different idea of what, you know, bad masking is and what good masking is. And but every, every time that I, I mention anything about masking n- not on the whole being bad, um, I get a lot of comments about it. You um, will. I kind of came up with this term called um, integrated masking, which is it basically... It covers um, is the idea. The idea is is that you have this mask, which is a representation of a person that's not you, and like everyone has different masks that they. It's, it's different to the term, but everyone has different masks that they put on for different situations. You know, you don't in- interact with your mom the same that you, that you interact with your manager or a significant yes. other, or yeah. you know, and. Integrated masking is all about under sort of peeling away the mask first, identifying who you are, what <laughs> what autism, what what part of autism is is you know what is autism to you, that kind of thing, and then choosing w- which situations you want to show your autistic side as well. So it's like. You're putting on a mask, I, but you're putting on an autistic mask. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I, I teach my students this, that there are times and places for everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, you can't go up to your mom and start cussing her out. Yeah. Your mom will not be happy with you. And a couple <sighs> of my students made the joke, yeah. And they're like, no, you're right, Ms. Gilmore. I'm like, right, because mm-hmm. that's disrespectful. You can't mm-hmm. go up to a manager and start cussing them out. You're going to get fired, as you should yeah. be. Yeah. And so you have to, neurotypical people mask too. There's this big yeah. thing that it's yeah. only an odd thing. No, they mask just as much as we do. It's a society thing. I would say the difference is that sometimes autistics, we buy into our own masks. We feel like if we unmask, it's shameful. If we unmask, we've kind of been trained that it's a no-no, bad juju, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And so I found that having the right place to unmask is important, like in my home. I used to not be able to when I was younger, be able to really unmask. If I did, I was made fun of, et cetera. So like- Having your sanctuary, I think, is important. Um, I'm lucky. I have a husband who I unmask with all the time. He gets Corinne. Corinne is that messy hair, tired, like, what do you want? <laughs> Just as much as the gorgeous person, right? So I think that it's important to kind of note that, you know, you have to have your support and your safe group. It doesn't always have to be family. Like mine, mm-hmm. in my case, is my husband, who is now my family. I married him by law. He's stuck with me. 
me, mm. <laughs> which is always my joke. I'm like, no refunds. <laughs> you signed the paper now. You can't go back. I gave you plenty of warnings. You know, you know what you're getting into. And he makes the same joke with me. Do and you so make any, any reasonable accommodations in the relationship? <laughs> well, we actually do within our relationship, which is the funny part. So like we read books. So something we discovered him and I was, oh God, we're trying to like buy a house, right? It was a nightmare. Yeah. And I'm like, ah! so what we did is we got a book for it. We read it together. Went great. We have one for marriage as well. We have marriage rules. We read it. It goes great. And it gives us this common thing to talk about. So yeah, that's why I said it's accommodations are not just like a work. Social it was my own situations, relationship we do. friendships, we, dating. Yeah, I think my favorite yeah. one I have with my husband is pause. When I'm really angry, I just start mm. spewing like a dragon. You know, just imagine me being a little dragon and just fire everywhere. It's, it's my favorite one as well, but it, it takes a while to implement. I can it does. tell everybody that. <laughs> it definitely does. And you know what's funny is he, the other day, I was like, pause. He kept going. I said, pause, yelled at him. And then I started yelling back. And he's like, pause. <laughs> you know, so I think it's acknowledging, not only acknowledging that, but being like, okay. And then, you know, him and I sat down and talked real. And you need those people you can talk real with. And that's the problem. You cannot talk real with everyone in the entire world. You mm. can't. Right? Not with your manager. You cannot. Not and with then, your I teacher. think this is the thing like, with masking. Everyone is like, oh, well, if I get accommodations, I unmask. No, mm. you still have to keep certain parts of this. You have to keep it professional. You know, this is about making sure you can thrive in a work environment, you can thrive in an education environment. Mm. But you have to do a part of it too. And your part is making sure that you succeed. You do your mm. best. And there sadly are certain societal standards to be met in that, especially in the work and education. You know, with my husband and I, there's no societal standards. You know, like I mess up, it's okay. So mm. I think that I always tell people, I started telling people recently, think of your own life. What accommodations do you do? Like, do you have a quiet house? Do you like having like a fountain in the background? Like what are play things you do like every day, you know, to kind of just work your system in? These are technically accommodations you've made to, to help yourself. yourself. Yeah. So. I think it's, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it seems, seems to me that, you know, cause I do a lot of stuff around dating and relationships and, you know, quite often a lot of people in the, you know, talking mostly about NTND relationships, autistic, non-autistic, there tends not to be a lot of conversations from either side about adjustments. It's kind of like um, this weird sort of dynamic where one person does things for them because they think that they won't do them if they don't do them. And then they get resentful towards the other person and the other person is like, I, d I didn't ask you to do that. And, like, and then you just It's like, actually something my husband and I had to talk about hmm. exactly what you're saying, because he's not autistic. I am. And of course, my seizure disorder adds a whole nother ball game. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I can imagine. And so when I first met him, he had never seen one of my seizures ever. Mm -hmm. And I was proud of that. And of course, that's changed um, for a man. And I remember my girlfriend used to say, oh, oh, just wait, just wait. And once he saw a seizure, he felt like he had to take over. Now, yeah. there were some incidences he had to because I can't, I'm not there. Like, right. I'm physically, mentally, I'm not, I may be physically, you know, there, but mentally I'm not, right. I'm not there. Mm. I cannot speak. And so we had to really, it made him and I have to talk about what are your needs, Corinne? What are your wants? What do mm -hmm. I do? Like, and so we kind of began to address it through my seizures, and then it was able to go over into other aspects. It is really so hard as an autistic person. I can tell you, like, it was so, I felt weak. I felt he was superior in this weird way, too. And I was like, oh, God. And I was like, I feel sick. I have to tell him because otherwise, like, you know. But we talked and talked and it actually is what made him and I so strong. Mm -hmm. And like my family, whether or not they're neurotypical or not, are like, you guys are such a strong unit. You're united, you know? And I'm like, yeah, we worked for this. This was mm -hmm. not something that came for free. Um, and so I think that though it sounds cruel, extreme health challenges, you'll see that people in those relationships, it either makes or breaks them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people forget that though autism is not an extreme mental, like it's not extreme health challenge, it is still something that impacts a relationship mm -hmm. and you have to talk about it and it's uncomfortable. It's not going to be fun and it's, it may mess up, but you may lose a person, 
But I think part of this idea of like, if you're going to be with someone, they have to know you and you have mm-hmm. to know them. It's a two way street. And so I loved you had talked about on your thing about how like, you know, you can't have one person just doing everything for the other. I actually yeah. showed it to my husband. By well, the way, which was you great. can't have one person <laughs> doing everything for the other person yeah. without them asking for it. Or yeah. if they do, it has to be give and take. So for example, you know, my husband's done a lot for me, but I've also done a lot for my husband, you mm. know, like we've found a way to support each other and equalize it out in our own relationship. And it's important to note that, you know, and you have to see the impact on someone else too. And I've mm-hmm. had a lot of my friends who are on the, I don't even on the spectrum, actually, they're just, they are disabled. And that's been a hard part for them where they're yeah. like, well, I'm feeling myself in this moment. And I was like, yeah, but your poor partner wants to help you. Why do you like assume positive intent until proven otherwise? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like assume, you know, you're I dating do. someone as a I- friend or more, you know, like assume positive intent. And I think this is something a workplace could do just as much as education. You know, we need to start assuming positive intent. We're all so defensive. We're all so like trying to guard ourselves. You don't get to know what we're supposed to be able to unmask. They're contradicting ideals. Hmm. So until like you assume positive intent, go out there and be like, well. So you know. masking is not just about the positive traits, like the, the stimming more in emotion, you know, for emotional regulation, thing, things of that nature. It's also the right okay i would i i am an adult and i like to be independent but i also really struggle with my executive functioning and um i'm not always good at good at making places on time or getting to places and i've i've you know just going back to perhaps my you know one of my past past relationships um i had a, the the reason why i was talking about sort of these asking about you know if you need help with things is because um there's a lot of sort of borderline infantilization infantilization with certain things like s- some people just feel a compulsion to to do things for you and th- for me i i like to I like to ask for things if I want something. I don't like someone just coming in and doing things for me all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, but 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 in you know, for, for example, if I was going to ask you for help, I would ask you to do that for me. Right. But in in this case, it was it was just thrust upon me, and it thrust upon me, and I conversations and conversations, and you know, it uh, as I said, it led to a lot of resentment from the other person. For, for me not pulling my weight or doing stuff um, and a lot of resent from, from me because um, Look, I didn't, ask, I didn't, for I didn't <laughs> ask for it. I don't want it. Stop. Like, <laughs> and then and I always feel like there's this looming weight over my head that every time this person does something to me, I feel smaller, you know, I and you feel, feel like you owe them. Yeah. Like, I owe I'm them. indebted to you. And that exactly. is something my husband and I had to work through because that was very much him for a while. You know, there was a, and this is where it became so difficult. I told people because I was like, there literally was a time I could not speak, but now I can shut up. I can talk again, (laughs) you know, and it's cruel, (laughs) but that's something him and I were working on because, Mm -hmm. you know, it's true and it doesn't take, I mean, so it took my husband, me having seizures to do this, but for other people, it's just hearing autism, you know, like, Mm -hmm. oh, autism, I have to provide everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I think have to make sure is... they get out and socialize and shower, yeah. and I have you to know, be like... on track of that and make sure that they've got. It's like another thing, like with with you're meltdowns. You're not my caregiver; you're my partner. With meltdowns, you know, I, say that to I friends like to too be of mine. Like you're my on my friend. own when I'm when I'm having a meltdown. I don't yeah. I don't need I don't need support in the way that people think that I need. And usually, like a lot of um, interaction with other people tend and people around tends to make it worse obviously depending on the person but no i feel you i have a select few even for my seizures i tell everyone to get out these yeah. are my people mm-hmm. and i think it's there's a point also where you know like these are accommodations and you're talking about your story right and i'm thinking of accommodations in my head yeah. you know reasonable adjustments within your relationship sure. you know just plan for five minutes right give you 30 minutes like you know before time I do that with a friend of mine, by the way. I tell her a meeting's 30 minutes before it is, and she always comes right on time. 
So, <laughs> you know, these are adjustments we make for our friendships. I because asked, I I've honor asked my them. parents to do the same thing about certain right. events. Like, and so this is a great example about like, right, that's an adjustment, right? Like, tell me 30 minutes beforehand. Tell me beforehand. And people have to be flexible with that. And if they're not, hmm. I don't think they're best for you then. If you're, they're not going to adjust, if they're not going to meet. And you have to meet them too, right? So if you're asking them to tell me 30 minutes beforehand, don't be an hour late. You know, like... It's kind of this fun, like you, you have to give and take in relationships everywhere in the world, whether or not be with the teacher, your boss, schools, et cetera, like everywhere. Right. Sure. So if you're going to ask for an adjustment, you're going to ask for an accommodation, honor it by doing your best, yeah. you know? And I think if the other person, on the other side, isn't going to listen, you can't reason with them. Mm. And that's kind of where like my father used to say this liner, you can't reason with unreasonable people. <laughs> <laughs> you're asking them to do something it's, they it's just sort can't a, do sort like of it's a, just not a, fair <laughs> a different way of saying you can't yeah. well i'm not going to say that and but. that applies to workplace <laughs> that applies to a teacher you have and there's certain situations where you're stuck right yeah. like when you're dating someone you're like i'm bye some yeah. people feel stuck but you always have the option of leaving and that's mm. the tougher part and you have the option of leaving a job you have an option of leaving and, this person but what, you know, it's a hard one, right? So I think mm. that you don't always have the option of leaving a school, though, or a teacher, which is the only no. one where, like, you actually, HR is another one. You don't have an option of going to a different HR person when they're the it's only one of, who does the job. It's kind of like job. a prison, isn't it? Some weird, weird sort of way. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's double. It's like, I was called a double-edged sword where it's like, yay, ow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like we're both being stabbed. But I think that's why... I loved this conversation you want to have about accommodations and adjustments because that is the point. Everyone thinks it's only workplace, it's only school, but it's so much greater than that. Mm. And that's been something that's been liberating my life to realize that it's mm. asking for my needs is what an adjustment is. Asking sure. for my needs is what an accommodation is. And it's tough, but once you are able to, it's you don't want to go back. <laughs> so so. I, we've been talking a lot about like for a variety of different things. I didn't think we would be talking about relationships, but we are. But what I wanted to ask is, you know, because you've mentioned about the, the deficit model of, a couple of times. Why do, why do we have this, this deficit model? And, you know, what's, what's the kind of background or history to its use? Well, the history is that disabled people, we're going to go way back in the day, they used to put <laughs> us in psych wards and asylums, just throw them yeah. away. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like be done. Now they're like, mm, we want to work with these people. There's too many of them. <laughs> like, let's start working with people. Let's start, you know, embracing differences. I would argue it's a basic human thing for neurotypicals that they fear, and autistics, everyone actually, we fear what we do not understand. Yeah. We fear the unknown. Yeah. And that is what neurodiverse people are to very much so many neurotypical people. We are unknown. They do not understand us. Like a, and like, so, a like a jam in the the social the yes. social constructs. <laughs> and so all these advocates, people came out and they started being like, no. And then we got the IDA Act. Now it's mm. legally they have to work with us. It's not just yeah. oh, I want to. I'll be charitable and work yeah. with these poor disabled peoples. No, you have to. Charity, a lot of the, now. the charity aspect of it as well, like and. Right? Like a I lot will of organizations. never fully understand the cherry aspect of it. I think it is a self-fed model to make people feel better about themselves. And there are a lot of goods that come out of these charities, right? Like there's a good idea of like helping others. Like that's a good thing. But I argue sometimes hero complex. A hero complex is I'm a savior. I saved this person. I saved mm. this person. You meet a well, lot it's, of... It's not an act of charity in a lot of cases because the, you know, it's been, you know, the utility of having a neurodiverse person in the workplace is you know there it, it occurs and it's you know we have people in our society who do really well for themselves and are neurodiverse and those who don't and so i think that and that's why i would say it's a spectrum of course yeah life is a spectrum and i think that that is the problem with the deficit-based model is that this model was created to appease the unknown and just think very negatively about people others yeah. do not understand they did an education medical still has a very deficit-based model 
Um, and same thing with business. And so well, it's, it's it quite a to- natural sort of human psychological thing, isn't it? We, we always yeah. focus on the negatives. Like they always stand out to us more things. We don't think, okay, this person's good at that. And how can I get the best out of this person? Exactly. So we're asking people to go against human nature in this sense mm. with these other models, being sure. person centric, being student centric, being employee centric, being, you know, human centric. Is sure. it these models? And then we're putting these models in business in particular into a place that's thinking profit. And a lot of people don't understand a business's job is to make the most money. That is yeah. its job. It's not there to be charitable or be kind and have these human virtues. No, it is there to make money. And so it, is not always profitable to help someone with an accommodation. It's not always profitable to do these things. If sure. you're thinking very black and white about it, once you reach the gray area, it can be, right? You know, a lot of schools said they wanted to work with me because they wanted an autistic advocate. They loved the idea of an autistic person empowering disabled people. It's like great in theory, but in practice. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel about the deficit made base model. It's like theory, it sounds fantastic, but in practice, it's disgusting. So I think that there's not a follow through. There's not a real practice. There's all these ideals. And so as human beings, we have to, I would say, not just as a country in the United States, but as a world on a world format, think, how are we going to address things we don't understand? We're really trying to change the way people think and be patient. Like we are asking people to go against what the a human nature Sure. And so I think part of the problem is, and I will never speak ill of an autistic or a disabled advocate, but when you push, 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 <laughs> it comes across bad. You're not helping the movement after a while. If you're no, going to become no. so negative, you're going to make no. people scared. They're not going to embrace this. They're going to throw it further away yeah. because that's easier. And I, that's something that's starting to happen with autism. It's starting to be like such a punchline that people no longer want to bring in advocates. They no longer want to work. And it's a real tension that's very real. You have mm. people within the autistic community who pretend like they're helping and they're not to. And I will not name names, but there's a particular place that comes to I, mind. I, so I just, yeah. it's frustrating, <laughs> right? I mean, people can think of their own place too when I say that. And that's the scary part. So yeah. how do we come to this place where, you know, I guess for me, whenever I, when I became an autistic advocate, when I got, joined the public platform, sure. I decided that I wanted to think about everyone like and not like me mm-hmm. instead of just the ones like me. And that sure. helps me out a lot, right? I, I do not have to understand what it is like to be a, an autistic who doesn't have a college degree, for example. Yeah, I don't yeah. have to understand that, but how can I help them? How can I help them get their needs met? It's like a case and that's by kind case of where my kind niches, of approach. right? Like they always say, like we have our mm. fixation. Mine is adjustments. Mine is needs. Mine's accommodations. I am the accommodations, modifications queen. Anywhere I go, any job I've had has been to do with meeting people's needs. <laughs> so yeah. I think that that is something to kind of, you know, that's how I went into. It. It's like here's my niche. Mm. This is my strength. I don't have to be a preacher. I'm not saving these people. I don't even like the term helping, but I do feel like I am helping, right? It's like, how can your needs be met? That's a helpful thing. Um, But being aware of that, that it could come across as a hero complex too. So I thought I, I I would, I would be less worried about coming across as a, uh, coming with a hero complex. I think you should, you know, you should take a little bit of self credit for, for helping people. Um, (laughs) Like there's nothing wrong with that. I I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've always, you know, highlighted that it tends to be when, when, when you when you n- don't really understand autism, or you don't really, you know, when you're growing up, like you tend to like come across things and issues in life, and and look at look at like the reasons for it, and these these are all not to do with autism, and you're like, okay, I I speak sometimes and I upset people. I think that I'm good at this. Oh, I must be a narcissist or <laughs> yep. things of that nature. So I, th- I think we're, we're kind of a bit more cautious around. Well, I don't know. I, positive. I'm, I'm definitely. No, you, you nailed it. The positive. We think very negatively on ourselves and it's harder for us to focus on the positive. 
just mm. as we think of others. It's easier to see the negative things people do instead of the sure. positive things they do. And it's so, you're not allowed to be black and white in this world where there are people I love very much, very deeply who have done horrific things to me, but I still love them. Sure. And it's a tough one, right? Like you have to remember the human aspect is that everyone has faults. Mm-hmm. And I guess what I'd want to end this with, you know, or just kind of like conclude for people is that at the end of the day, you can only control yourself and your actions, sure. right? And so I wish everyone would feel this way because I think it would help out because if it's like, look, you can only control yourself and your actions. I'm asking for this adjustment. So that way I can better control my actions. I can better be myself. I can better perform. I can better, better, better. Other people go, okay, it's not about me personally. You're asking for your needs because I'm going to adjust this so that way you can be better met and vice versa. Then you're going to adjust so I can be better met. It's a meeting in the middle. So I wish that in this weird way, it's like we would all be more aware of our own actions and their impact. Hmm. You know, where is the line of you're asking for an accommodation that is unreasonable. You're asking for people to do things that is a little tough. You know, so I think the acknowledgement of that, that you're asking someone to change their actions to benefit both of you, especially in work. So I would say in every relationship, right? Like my friend, 30 minutes, I gave her 30 minutes. I'm not mad anymore because she's coming on time. I set her up to succeed, you know, and I think that is the big focus on an adjustment, on an accommodation, on a modification is that Mm -hmm. you are setting people up to succeed. And I always make a really mean joke. So if they fail, it's on them. <laughs> you know, I set you up. I put you on your pedestal. I did everything. And if you're not going to do it, we got problems. No. I'm really being satiristic. So I know you. Are. I can, I can tell. That. I can tell. But yes, you know. Well, I had to make sure to clarify that. End the podcast. Boom. <laughs> Boom. That cross sucks. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean it. I think that. It is a two-way street. You know, you can control your actions. You can ask for these things. Do you, you know, want to empower people? I don't know. I'm I, <laughs> I, I just, just want to say before, before we move into our Instagram question and the, the song of the day and all that, I just wanted to share my, my story because um, I don't talk a lot about my work on, on podcasts because I'm a, I'm, I'm wary about the crossover between these two worlds, mm. you know, independent thought versus part of an organization tends to be a bit, but I, I, I started, um, at this amazing organization, um, that did a lot of work that does look a lot of work in inclusion in different, different areas. And it was, it was kind of something that I picked up during COVID. Um, so I started, I started, um, working online and I've stayed working online since even, even though the office is like other side of the country. And, you know, my, my, my journey through that was that I, I came across, I came across a, a few hurdles, shall we say around, you know, my, my mental health in the workplace and around accommodations in the workplace. And I was given a job coach. That was kind of one of the the first accommodations that we got, and you know this this person was like the, there's been a few people who've, who've come in to try and help out, and the organisations paid for them and stuff because um, they're great, they're awesome. But you know this what this one person called called Avril, um, such an amazing amazing woman, and she uh, um, actually has has advocated for me on many occasions, you know, outside her sort of job coachy kind of role, you know, and over time, you know, be, being able to to understand where the difficulties are, put accommodations in place, you know, the things that were negatives are now just erased because of my accommodations. And so I'm yeah. left with all this space and this clear head and this, you know, the ability to be creative and, they have actually done things that are not deficit based. You know, they've done things, they've adjusted my role. They've given me um, different things to do in different places and um, a lot of space for creativity. And, you know, I, I, I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm permanent in my job now. 
they're, they're getting me in to do some more presentations and things for the organization, which I'm very happy about. Yeah. They're meeting and your needs and then you're meeting my meet needs. their needs, right? And like even, even more like exactly. now and in a lot of cases, my, you know, Avril always says to me, you're the person to go to, like everyone talks about you, even though they don't know that I work <laughs> with you. And I'm like, Oh my God. Like, so that that's just that's just an idea and, and you know this this organization is amazing i'm not saying that it's going to be all all like that for everybody but there is there is hope and i you know if i i we used to speak in it earlier about you know you come to a crossroad and do you do you bail or do you you know try and try and work stuff out and for me it was nailing down exactly what i had issues with trying to come talk to my manager and think of accommodations at work and them being whole holy for it. And it worked perfectly. And, and yes. And I love that amazing. story because I had the same thing <laughs> in college. I had Danny Ness in college. Yeah. I hadn't had seizures for like God, five years. And then they hit out of nowhere. And um, I was in and out of hospitals and everything. And Danny Ness would just be like, Hey professors, we need you. Da, 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 da. That was my Avril. And I always make the joke, I want to be people's Avril. I want to be people's Danny Ness for the workforce because I think that's what people need. You know, we can't always do this. And Personalized. so having that in-betweener who's like, hey, this is what's going to help you. This isn't. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear a job coach took that on too because a lot of them don't. You know, so I'm like, yay. Um, but yeah, I feel like when you have that person who knows you, who knows your potential, who knows you're just a rock star mm -hmm. and would do great things and supports you to do so. So even if you fall, they have your back. It's hugely important. And yes, I will tell you, like, workplaces that have accommodated needs for people, I always get calls that are like, wow, our productivity went up. Whoa, like, we're doing better. I'm like, yeah, because their needs are being met. You got excited employees. You're letting them be creative. Um, I had a school I was working at. It was funny because there was lots of drama, but I just ignored it. And it was all online at the time. So I was like, I'm going to just keep pushing along. And I got... The district was like, you were one of our top RSPs of the year from parent survey. Right. You know, if you're like only one person on your case, right. like you can get a hold of the parent. Right. And I was like, whoa. But that was because I had kind of just, you know, through virtual learning was able to make my own accommodations and just make it and work. You, you get used and in situations where you have no accommodations, you get used to negativity all the time. So it's so like, it's, real, it's, it's a, a really like punch to the face. You're like, whoa, something yeah. positive. Oh my uh -huh. God, I'm an asset to the team. Like, and you are. It's like you got <laughs> hired for a reason, you know, and I think that's something I have to remember, especially as I, you know, a lot of schools are offering me jobs at the end of school year, you know, they're like, oh, get you back in person. So I think that, you know, setting yourself up to succeed is on you and on your company. And when it's right, it's right, right? Like it was the right moment for your company. You're like, I need help. They're like, yes. And it builds. Hmm. And that's a good thing. And we need more of that. I think that's what's missing in the workforce is that two-way streetism of I help you, you help me. The double it's, double empathy in practice. Yeah, and that's where the, I feel like if we get rid of the deficit-based model, I know a lot of UK businesses actually are lessening it, which makes me excited. Mm -hmm. um, the UK is very far ahead of the United States on this front. Um, yeah. A lot of us make jokes. We're like, wow, we got to go up, you know, you know. And then you go to India where they're finally acknowledging – Disabilities. Oh Lord, don't, don't, don't even, don't even go. <laughs> so, like, and I say that, so... and I don't want to be biased against India. No, I, I understand what you mean. With people in it's, India, yeah, um, who are very happy that they fought really hard for it to finally become mm. a thing. And so, I don't want to undermine the Indian culture. And this is not Native American. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> but pitch I have in seen because... a phenomenal <laughs> group of people coming out and fighting for rights over there. Same thing mm. in Indonesia and our Asian countries. So, I think that. The world is a spectrum on this front. The jobs are a spectrum. And that deficit-based model is a step in progress is at least we have accommodations, but we need yeah. to keep going. And yeah. I think that's where people get stuck. They're like, no, I want to stay here. I'm like, let's keep going. Look, you accommodate you and I, and we flourish in a company, right? Like flourish. We want to work. We'll do extra work. We work extra hard. Yeah. So I think it is important to note that like, if your needs are met, you're going to do better. Cause mm -hmm. instead of being like, I have a migraine, I'm exhausted. You can go be creative. You can go do what you need to do. 
you know, I always make the joke. I'm like, instead of having a seizure, I get to go be with kids longer. Yeah. You know, just bad. I use a lot of dark humor, gallows humor. I like, so I love the dark humor. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's right in my alley. I you don't know, use that a lot on the podcast, but. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Can... I made you use it a lot today. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no, don't. So for don't, your don't podcast viewers, that. yes, gallows humor <laughs> is sarcasm. It's beautiful. Yeah. I will say that you have to acknowledge darkness and make light of it. And that's mm. what gallows humor is. And that's what it's I feel accommodations Jung- and adjustments could be too in the world. Of... We Looking have a struggle. Your shadow. <laughs> we'll make it beautiful. Yeah, we overcome it. You know, and overcoming it looks different for people. In sure. your case, it was getting your needs met. For me, it's getting my actually. Mm. No, for everyone, it's getting their needs met. <laughs> yeah. I do want to leave you leave you guys this this question segment saying that you know keep keep trying and that yes. don't just don't give up. I know it's tempting, but you you know you, you need to stick at it. And f- find jobs, find places. Sure, the 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 benefits and the you know the disability benefits and things of that nature will help tide you over. But it's not for everybody, but for a lot of people, you know, trying to find a good workplace and a good work is a really good idea. And don't think it's something. It's sometimes it's just it doesn't work. It doesn't have to be your bad or their bad. It just didn't work, sure. right? And so every experience in your life, whether it be good or bad job related or not is going to build on each other and learn from them take this as a learning opportunity you know every time i had to leave a job i was like what went well what didn't for the uh, position at the um charter school for example i was like i should have gone in there with my accommodations sure. i shouldn't have waited you know i should have i mean they took two months to hire me i should have had my accommodations mm-hmm. done and i learned that and for my new job my accommodations were already done it made a huge difference coming in with like boom you know, I so I also found get a job some that was part time. You know, and so I, that's that. why I said it's kind of just like think about this as a way to adjust, right? Okay, what went well, what didn't? I actually literally write out a list of pros and cons, <laughs> like, and then learn from them. What do I want to tweak? What's on the company? What's on me? And then you move forward. I do this whether or not it's with a relationship. Like when I used to break up with someone, I do the same thing. I'm a systems girl. I like my systems. So yes, my pros and cons lists, I threw them away. I burned them because I didn't want everyone to see all of them. But like, you know. Life is pain, but life is is also there to learn from. (laughs) It's a beautiful disaster. It's a, you know, complex thing that's neither good nor bad. Sometimes it just is. So remember that. We love to be so black and white and we can be, right? My pros and cons list, I can be as black as white as I want to be. But with life itself, you can't be. So, yeah, don't give up. Thank you for that, Karen. Of course. Thank you. Um, So let's let's move into we we actually have one question with my very poor organizational skills of doing it. No self insults. No, not allowed. Half an hour before the the podcast started, but we do have a question from Isaac Jackson. One three three. What is one perception of autism in the workplace you wish you could change? Ooh, that's a great one that we don't understand social cues all the time. And so you have to walk on eggshells. Mm. Um, it's a little frustrating when like, and I say it comes from a place of care. This is a great example of this is a place of care. Like, this is great. But I've been in a place where I had um, people be like, don't touch Corinne. She's autistic. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm a hugger. <laughs> you can ask. Me too. <laughs> you know, right? Because there are some of us who do like the physical touch. But for someone who didn't, that would probably be like, a, oh, I'm really glad. Thank you. Yeah. You know, but for me, I was like, ask me. So mm-hmm. I think that there's this edge sword of blanketing everything, you know, sure. like all autistics, all autistics. Um, my favorite is one girl was like, you don't look autistic. And I was like, what, am I not a guy? That thing, that's what autism looks like. And the poor thing was bright red, like, um, no, I was like, or I'm not doing this a bunch. And she was like, so I think that kind of remembering there's a stereotype. There yeah. are some people who meet the stereotype. There is no shame in that. Yeah. But I wish that people would ask, mm. you know, and that box, you got to treat people. Like, I don't want them to ask. I want them just to do what they did, Corinne. So get over it. Got to but treat I them think- as an adult, as an individual. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, I've also worked with someone with autism who was a nightmare. 
who didn't want us asking. And so it was, I felt so bad for the school because there's one like me who's like, just ask me, I'm easygoing. The other one was not, no. <laughs> was a no. nightmare. It was like, don't ask me this. I said it. Da, 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 da. So I kind of get where they're at though. So I wish something that would, I guess, two-edged sword. One, I wish that some autistics would self-reflect, realize that, you know, yeah. Yeah. like this is tough. Secondly, is I wish that there wasn't always a blanket solution for everything. Mm. You know, like there's like tiered. So like ask. Yeah, ask, ask. Communication. Communicate. <laughs> bridging the gaps in relationships, bridging the gaps in the workplace, bridging the gaps <laughs> in the education. You can everything. make adjustments and accommodations and that's how you do it. <laughs> everything. Yeah, I think I wish that people would just ask and not assume. So I guess mm. that'll be my overarching, my little blanket is... I wish people wouldn't assume as much mm. with autism because yes, I'm considered very high functioning, which I was like, they laugh. I'm like, okay. So you're not just, I'm you're very not just adept. high functioning. You're very, very high functioning. Well, I guess so. My you God. know, I've had doctors be like, there's no way you're autistic. You're too social. <laughs> and my doctor starts <laughs> laughing. She's like, yeah. And then you overstimulate Crit and she's gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I think that's the problem with workplaces is they've been fed this, Either, you know, we just aren't social. And so I yeah. think that there needs to be a talk about this, a communication about, hey, like, talk to your individual. It just seems Don't so simple, Don't assume that because I'm it? autistic. It's... I can't tell you how many times I've applied it's to just, a job. Just ask. And I tested this theory out <laughs> where I put I was autistic. They wouldn't even interview me. And yet if I said I wasn't, I would usually get into the interview. Yeah. That's, because of that's... that assumption. So I just wish there was more of a... Treat it as an individual basis. Mm. You know, so that's the, you know, the negative, I don't want to say negative, but the struggles some people have are not the struggles of others. Sure. So, I mean, part of the thing I wish businesses would do is have a meeting about accommodation, have a meeting about needs and adjustments. That can like what they do in my workplace. workplace. Yes. It and works. that is something It doesn't I need to be like a massive meeting or anything. It could just be like a half an hour kind of. Yep. ongoing thing that you do a bi-weekly or monthly or you know just at and least that's something, something i've actually asked something. for businesses to start doing that they were like really i'm like let's just try it but a lot of people you have to adapt things and try things out my god oh my goodness <laughs> what is this you met, you, your sarcasm is rub rubbing off on me i'm getting into like a, a sarcasm hole um i'm very used to sarcasm because of my <laughs> wonderful absolutely not sarcastic dad <laughs> oh no my husband okay. taught me sarcasm and his whole family is so they always say the best way to learn a language is to be fully submersed in the culture um that is the gilmores that i am mm. happily married into they are all okay. very sarcastic i used to cry you know oh. so i think that giving us the opportunity to learn i guess would be my last moment like yeah. there's so many times where i'm working with businesses and they think that we can't learn we're yeah. like suddenly like we are who we are and i'm like no everyone can learn you know, so it's like, give me the opportunity. Okay, I made a mistake. Let's learn from this, right? Mm. Do I need an accommodation or can I learn something new? Like sarcasm. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I think that, that probably leads us to a nice sort of ending to that Instagram question. Yeah. So it's time for song of the day, Corinne. Do you have your song ready, ready and waiting? Oh, was I supposed to do that? It's okay. You can, you can, we can, what we can. What was that about organization skills? I it's thought okay. I sent it to you. you. Oh, you may have actually. Let me have a look. It was a while ago, people. And you know what? This is an accommodation he's doing for me. He's helping me find it. You know, that's wonderful, what good wonderful do. Thomas. Yeah. So modest. Thomas is helping me out. I'm not used to being helped out. It's a little weird. <laughs> I'm used to helping everyone else. I don't even remember what song I chose. <laughs> Isn't it Come Together? It's Come Together. Ooh, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah. We'll go with Come Together. <laughs> no, I don't like the Beatles. And then the reason I chose this song, I don't know if I'm supposed to say it, or do you? <laughs> no, go for it, please. Uh, the reason I chose now. this song was I wish people would come together more. The other one I almost chose is Why Can't We Be Friends, which I'd almost rather listen to. <laughs> like, you know, why can't we be friends? Be friends. Why can't, why can't we, we be, friends? be friends? Why can't? Because yep. I think that 
so much in the world, it's us versus them right now. In I mean, American politics worldwide. Um, yeah, I really wish, man, I'm stuck. Can we just do Why Can't We Be Friends instead? Yeah. We, can, we can We can do like, we'll, we'll put them both on the playlist. Thank you. Sorry, guys, you have two songs. Got two friends, but, uh, two songs, you know, two very I good just, songs. Right, and it's about coming together more, and I think that's something that's missing right now. And I've talked Bridging to a lot of people, gaps. and it's like kindness is a rarity. I want mm. kindness to come back. So, what, what's friends, the artist kind. for "We Can't Be We Can't Be Friends"? Why can't we be friends? W A R. W A R. This is war. Oh, maybe this is the place I found. Yeah, it's by war. Provided by YouTube by Avenue Records. <laughs> We'll find it. It's we can't be. For, we, I think most people know what that song I've is just from our little re- rendition. <laughs> these are older songs. I didn't watch. People like I don't know these songs. Oh well, yeah. you can expand your horizons. I don't know. I always tell people when it comes to life and things and overcoming things, we're having a Tim Guns make it work moment. If you've ever seen mm. Project Runway? He's always like, make it work, make it work, make it work. <laughs> um, so whether or not I'm working with a student on their IEP, working in one-on-one tutoring working as an advocate i'm always trying to have make it work moments so. sure sure <laughs> yeah i think this comes to the end of our chat karen thank you have you enjoyed your 40 40 experience oh yeah i have thank you you did a great job <laughs> i'm very glad and if you have enjoyed the 40 40 experience yourself you can find the podcast anywhere pretty much anywhere on your podcasting streaming services, including YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, blah, blah, blah. You and Social Audio do the same thing. You can get it anywhere. (laughs) I add the link to my LinkedIn, by the way. So I'll add the link once we're done. Thank you. (laughs) And um, of course, and if you want to stay up to date with my daily life, the kind of stuff that I do that isn't content creation, the best place to do that is Instagram. Uh, and of course, if you want to get in contact with me uh, to be to be on the podcast or to get me on as a guest to do some public speaking or some modeling, uh, please go to my website, thomashenley.co.uk. And that's the spiel from me. <laughs> Don't know if many people stick around to that spiel. You know, like, I, f- I think there's like a, a drop off rate for people like, just about the point where they know that it's going to be the end of the video and then they kind of switch on to another one. But well, I actually it. added you on YouTube, by the way. I oh, didn't know you had a YouTube you. channel. So I was like, thank oh, I'm here. So I listened to the spiel. <laughs> 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 thank you very much, Corinne. Anyway, I hope you all are doing well and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Corinne. And mm-hmm. we'll see you later. Bye, guys.